So uh, welcome everyone to our uh, Cyan Financial Math uh, Seminar Series. And it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to have our, our speaker. Um, I'll introduce um, Professor Alexander in a moment, but before that, I just wanted to take a little care of some housekeeping items. So first off is the next seminar will be next month on March 4th. We'll have Marcel Newts presenting uh, and we're switching to once a month uh, seminar uh, time slots. Then other uh, housekeeping item is questions. If you have questions, please type them into the chat. And at the end of the talk, we will call upon you to ask them if you, if you have questions and you'd like to add, ask them yourself and turn on your video. And as well, at the end of the session at two o'clock, we'll move into an informal part where you can stick around and just have casual conversations off the record and could be focused on the talk or, or anything else related to math finance really. Uh, so with that, those housekeeping items out of the way, I'd like to introduce uh, our speaker of today. So Professor Carol Alexander is a professor of finance at Sussex University. She's also a visiting professor at Peking University HSBC Business School and a co-editor of the Journal of Banking and Finance. Professor Alexander holds a PhD in algebraic number theory from the University of Sussex, has held several positions in financial institutions around the globe, and was a chair of the board of Premia. She publishes widely on a broad range of topics, including volatility theory, option pricing and hedging, and alternative investments, among many others. She's written an, and edited a number of books in mathematical finance and, math, I'm sorry, mathematics and finance, and published extensively. It's a pleasure to welcome Professor Alexander to tell us all about trading and hedging Bitcoin volatility. So all yours, you can share the screen. I hope so, <laughs> if it works. Thank you very much, Sebastian. It's been really um, good to be asked to, to do this, although I feel slightly fraudulent because there's not going to be an awful lot of maths in this talk. Um, I, I could have perhaps done you know, something very mathematical, but recently I've been taken up so much with doing work on crypto and, and keeping up with what's, you know, learning about this incredible market microstructure that I haven't really, my recent publications, um, uh, and the ongoing work that I would normally give in a research seminar is mainly on, on crypto and not particularly mathematical. But there's a bit of math. Anyway, so let me hope that this is going to work because my Wi-Fi decided to go down and my, um, my machines decided to be slightly recalcitrant at the moment. But let's hope that, wait a minute. Aha, good. Right, excellent. So here we are today, and um, I'm going to be doing an introduction to the general area because a lot of people are fairly new to crypto. But then there's three parts in the sort of method methodology. The first part is more or less purely empirical. Um, it's looking at physical volatility and the price discovery. And I'm going to be talking about the data. It's very important to get the right data. So let's look at that. Um, and then looking at the centralized exchanges behavior as opposed to decentralized exchanges. Um, one really does need to know about this system in order to do things um, properly. So um, that's why I'm gonna give that long introduction. Talking about a couple of already published papers. One of them is in quantitative finance with Michael Dacos. He's my fourth year PhD. Um, and the second one is with um, somebody who's just started his second year, Daniel Heck and that's just come out in Journal of Financial Stability. Um, and there's a few other papers on price discovery and microstructure, but very similar. These are with co-authors in uh, Peking University um, and also um, a master's student, um, Hamish Massey, who's now working for the Bank of Ireland. But I'm only gonna be covering the results in the first two papers. And then I'm gonna go on to um, options. Uh, the options markets in crypto have only really, uh, the last year they've been acting more like a mature type of options markets. Variant swaps um, have been traded uh, on chain, that's the equivalent of over the counter, for um, about two years. But again, it's very difficult to get traded variant swap rates. So I'm gonna be talking about the theoretical fair value, the variants um, like the VIX, the Bitcoin VIX. And this is work with Armin Imurai, who's um, uh, uh, the colleague of, of Daniel Heck. They both come from TU Munich. Uh, where I supervise their master's thesis, and um, he's also just started his second year. Um, and this paper is available from the Journal of Alternative Investments. Um, also, the methodology document for the live streamed crypto compare, um, we can't call it the big 
the Bitcoin VIX, um, CBOE don't like that. We couldn't even call it BVX, but we, we've called it BVIN. Um, and um, so that is available from Crypto Compare. Um, and there is a link, hopefully just testing it works. Okay, that's the methodology document. Um, fairly standard, apart from the fact that the data are completely different. I mean, options spring up all over the place. You know, Suddenly, Derivit decides to issue a new type of option without telling anyone. I mean, you have to change the whole methodology. Okay, um, and now um, the last one, if I get time, hope I do, because this is ongoing work. This is with um, Ju Deng, Jen, Ju, <laughs> Ju, Ju Deng and Bin Zhu from um, uh, uh, the International... Uh, um, University, University of International Business and Economics. It's not Peking University. That's um, Jen, Jen Deng, sorry, very bad for names. And Bin is from University of Connecticut. And this is something we've just started working on from just before Christmas. Um, and um, yeah, we just finalized the slides about an hour, half an hour ago. Um, and uh, so I'll only be just talking a little bit about the, the, the analytic solution to the hedging problem with margin constraints and some of the, um, the empirical work. Um, okay, so just to give a general overview to the subject, and Sebastian, please do remind me when I'm like 15 minutes from the end, because I, I don't know about the timing on this talk at all, as I said, I just sure. finished last we'll, we'll Okay, so um, this was taken, um, I get a weekly update from Great South Gates Digital Asset Management, most of the introductory slides are taken from them, they're very good, you can sign up yourself. Um, this was as of the 2nd of February, I think the current price of Bitcoin is getting back to 40,000, so um, you can see that, I mean, I think Ether, uh, I don't know why they don't even write names. I mean, Ethereum is the blockchain, Ether is the currency. And this is Ripple, XRP, <laughs> they used to three, sort of, anyway, whatever. Um, so uh, you, we will look at some of the exchanges and trading, but you can see the vol. Um, Bitcoin's got the lowest vol, but just the physical vol last 30 days is over 100%. Ripple 200%, this sort of figure is, is, is normal. So you can imagine the sort of vega that you have on these positions, particularly when options go quite far out as well. Anyway, so that's an overview of some of the major currencies and the top 10 ranked currencies, because there's all sorts of ranking by volume traded and this sort of thing, um, have been doing very well since December. Um, and uh, more recently, the, and so this is the sort of uh, by market cap rank. Um, and the sort of performance uh, from 1,000 in September to about 3,000 now. So you've got 300% return every space the last six months. Oh, by the way, I'm really glad that um, I, I bought Do Dogecoin. I was telling Sebastian about this at the weekend, thinking that maybe Elon Musk will tweet Dogecoin. And he did. So we're going to have a look at that. I already built it into the slides anyway, to look at the Dogecoin tether perpetual. I mean, what can get more dodgy than that? But anyway, <laughs> so is it a safe haven? Well, no, because I mean, most of this year, you've had a correlation with gold and with S&P 500, which are, of course, very highly correlated now because the same people are driving both markets. Um, and uh, so although around Christmas, when the beginning of this latest bubble, this is now the fourth bubble we've had in Bitcoin markets. Um, Ether usually comes later and that's what we're seeing now. Um, uh, we're, we're rapidly getting back to positive correlation territory. So the sort of idea that this is a safe haven asset I think is completely out of the window. Nevertheless, it has its own characteristics. The whole of the crypto space is completely different and it is evolving at a rate of knots by people that don't know anything about finance. This is what's the scary thing. Anyway, so there's quite a few traders that have gone in there. They, they know what they're doing, but the people that are de developing all the, uh, let's talk about the ecosystem. Okay, so these are the main players. None of them know much about finance, to be honest. So there are the issuers. These are project managers. Instead of having a large IPO that takes years and needs a proper track record, they just put a white paper up on the internet and then they get it ranked by these ranking sites. Uh, Crypto Compare is by far the most developed of the ranking sites, and that's the one that I've been working with. But there are hundreds of them, CoinGecko, CoinMarketCap. I mean, there are stablecoin ranking sites. Stablecoins are um, different to, digital, uh, to, to um, uh, the central bank digital currencies. Uh, the CBDCs are not actually cryptocurrencies because they're on what we call a private blockchain. It means it doesn't need a consensus algorithm. It means that the central counterparty can do whatever they like. So it's not, it's really just digital cash. It's, you know, you've gone from silver to paper and now it's just 
you know, on a, on a ledger, um, which makes it easy to track. And so that's why countries like China have been particularly proactive in these, um, these USD um, CBDCs. But the stable coins, in particular Tether, I do want to tell a little bit of story about those. Um, these are supposed to be tracking a basket. Typically, it'll just be a single thing like, you know, dollar stable coin or euro stable coin. But it's just basically a license to print. So we'll be talking about what's happening with stable coins a bit. And then the centralized exchanges and, and decentralized exchanges. So the centralized exchanges, the most developed of these is Coinbase, used to be GDEX, also Bitstamp, and there are thousands of them, absolutely thousands of them. Regulators are only beginning to get to grips with this area. And of course, there's software and data analytics companies are beginning to get in on there. And when their revenue, particularly on exchanges, is in something like Bitcoin, of course, they're raking it in. Anyway, so let's go to crypto compare at the moment. This was taken, I think, a few days ago. We saw that um, Ripple was um, by um, the um, rank of, of, of um, the volume rank. Um, was so this is 1.64 billion this is 11.1 billion top tier volume in in total we'll have a look at what those figures are right now um ether has gone right up ripple's gone up and dodgy coin coin was that's what i thought oh let's go and have a look at it so um here we are at the moment okay bitcoin's up at 36 ether's right up at um at uh, and these are a minus bitcoin's gone to b plus my god okay that was very recent sorry excuse me um, so normally it would be A minus, it's the highest rank they give. Something like Dogecoin is C. Um, and so the direct vol, that's the USD vol. Most of the trading is actually in Tether, which is, it's basically tied to the dollar. Um, uh, so the cross is that, I, you know, if I'm trading Dogecoin, I have to trade it against Tether because you, you can't trade it against USD. Um, well, you can, but there's very little. Most of it, 5.5 billion of dodgy coin is maybe on OKEX across on the tether cross. All right, so that's crypto compared. This is a ranking site. It's got so much more though. I mean, their research on, um, it's really worth going around this site. Look at the exchange review, tells you a lot. I use that for teaching. All these reports, very well um, researched. And I'm gonna be coming back to this site later when we look at the um, digital asset indices. And in particular, we'll be looking at this volatility index here. So do explore that site. I won't um, dwell on it because I've got too much else to cover. Stable coins. This is a stable coin um, called Crypto Slate that has a lot of stable coin rankings. And look at the look at the market cap: twenty six billion of Tether. I mean, it's extraordinary. I was complaining about it last summer, um, summer before last, when it had got to three billion. And you know, there, were, there were articles in the FT and things like that, that Tether was being pumped around. There was also a paper by Griffin and Jans in the Journal of Finance, which I'll talk about, about how Tether is being printed and fed through um, to the centralized exchanges where exchanges like Binance, um, their derivatives only trade against Tether. But 26 billion of market cap, and they're supposed, all these stable coins are supposed to be fully collateralized. So the Tether company is supposed to have 26 billion of US assets, US dollar assets. But the trouble is that they've escaped the regulation the whole time. The New York um, state attorney actually issued a civil action against them because the, the Tether company and the Bitfinex exchange are all the same people, okay? Um, um, some people have resigned, but it's, it's basically that the, the this is an on-chain map that Griffin and Chams I'll talk more about what happens on chain. You can actually trace it using the block explorer. You can see where the flows are. Lots of people are doing that now. Um, and uh, so a, a, a clockwise flow is from to the nodes. Okay, so you can see that via some un unidentified wallet here, it goes onto Bitfinex. It then goes via another unidentified wallet, wallet onto Poloniex. It goes to various others and then ends up, a lot of it ends up in Binance, Huobi and OKEx. Now this was drawn in 2019. Since then, these three exchanges have come to dominate. These, these other exchanges have had problems, um, management problems and lawsuits. It's, as I said, not um, uh, uh, the, uh, these are, um, it's not the CFTC, although the CFTC has gone after another one called BitMEX about derivatives trading, but um, the New York State Attorney has for the last two years um, been um, trying to um, uncover what's happened to the collateralization of the Tether company. So on-chain, 
Um, there are plenty of exchanges called decentralized exchanges. Now, there's a wealth of information. I don't have time to go. This is the, um, the, 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 the most, um, uh, most important of them is Uniswap. What it does is that it swaps um, these ICOs, uh, the, what, um, they're called ERC20 tokens or other ERC protocols. What is ERC? Um, Ethereum request for comments. So the Ethereum um, company have developed a, a sort of set of um, uh, um, terms and conditions, a bit like um, the ISDA documentation, you know, back in the 90s where uh, over-the-counter products didn't have a proper unified documentation and now we will go to the ISDA, the Swaps and Derivatives Association. Well, if the Ethereum Foundation has, has become a little bit like that. So most of these um, initial coin off offerings use what's called an, um, an ERC-20 uh, protocol, which allows them, actually Ether has to be wrapped up in it because Ether was the first ICO before the company built up um, the Ethereum Foundation and, and developed the ERC um, protocols. So you actually, for Ether to go on there, and there's only 1.3, billion at the moment here but this liquidity provision so if i want to earn money and um, some interest on my ether it's like peer-to-peer -peer exchange or i can um i can swap um i mean these are all large cap ones but i can swap some little thing like i don't know um uh uh solar coin or something like that for another um erc20 so it's a marketplace for these tokens lots of interesting stuff on that this um a very interesting um, data of on-chain flows showing Binance, uh, there was a hack on Binance. Um, this is the whalealert.io. So you can look at that real time. Again, I don't really feel as though I've got enough time to, to go through that because I'm still in the introduction, but go and have a look at whale.io now if you're a bit bored with me and just wait for a minute. And you can see flows going from maybe Poloniex, Coinbase, OKEX, Bitstamp, but then some other, um, uh, unidentified wallets okay so these are the major flows they're only big flows more than something like 10 million or something like that usd this is a minefield of date i love this i only just found crypto quant so these are my favorite charts but if you go to crypto quant and have a look at things like the stable coin supply ratio so this is the ratio of bitcoin market cap relative to the aggregated mar market cap of all stable coins which is basically 99 percent tether so you can see, although it's a bit exaggerated there, the reduction in Tether um, because of the uh, collateralization problems and then a, a gradual issuance. I mean, Tether is issued on, um, it was originally on the Omni layer, as you saw on the crypto slate, but now it's issued on, on, um, on Ethereum, on Tron, on, so it's very, very hard to keep track of where Tether is flowing. Um, Griffin and Shams could do it because all they had to look at was the Bitcoin block explorer. But now you've got to search all the block explorers across all the blockchains to see where Tether is. It's everywhere. And I mean, look at this. <laughs> anyway, um, so I won't dwell on that because I'm not going to be talking about on-chain at all. I think that's a, a marvelous area. There's so much data, um, machine learning algorithms for using minus position index, um, uh, other sort of things for predicting Bitcoin prices, high frequency. I'm sure lots of people are doing it, but I know you could do it so much better. So definitely, I think we should have a look at that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the first paper. This is um, work that we started um, actually um, in 2018 or no, no, 19, the data finished in 31st of March. So we probably finished this around summer or so. And um, this is just a note about the type of data that you can get. Um, simple um, single index model, market beaters, okay, so these are just the beaters of, for example, the Gemini spot for Bitcoin with the CTI 30 crypto market wide index. And then there's another index called the Crix, and then there's the MVDA25, that obviously has 25 coins in it. Um, I like the CCI30 because that's not a, not a straightforward uh, VWAP, but it's the square root of the volume. So it gives Bitcoin less weight than, for example, in the CRIX, which is and MVDA, which are volume weighted price indices. So these are market wide indices. OK. Um, and um, uh, so, sorry, volume, market cap weighted index. So it's, it's the I, it's it's. Uh, the the price indices, the individual price, Bitfinex, Coinbase. Uh, so um, these are individual exchange prices. Okay, so this is a pure price that you can actually trade. 
Bitfinex, Coinbase, Coinbase, etc. These crypto compare CC, Coin Market Cap, Coin Gecko are a Bitcoin price index. That's the VWAP, and the market wide indices are cap weighted, the normal sort of SP type thing, apart from the CCI 30, which is square root of cap. So there's a volume weighted average price um, over many, many different coins, including crosses and ridiculous. You can read about it in the paper, how these things are, are constructed. And I just wanted to highlight the different simple market beta that you would get. I mean, if you use single coin indices against the CCI 30, this looks pretty robust, doesn't it? And also the crypto compare one. But if you use coin gecko, you get 0.374 against the CCI 30. And also, um, with Crix and MVDA, you get quite different results to the CCI 30. So it really matters what you choose as if you're going to do this type of analysis. If you're doing um, a, a proper like portfolio allocation, you, you, you shouldn't be using this type of data because it's not traded. Okay, and be careful about, I like the CCI 30, I think it's the best one. Um, this is for Ether um, and it's um, different numbers, but the same problem across all of them. It's not just Bitcoin and Ether, it's Litecoin, it's Ripple, it's all of them. So this is a, a plot of the difference. The red line is the difference between the coin market cap VWAP price index for Bitcoin and the crypto compare VWAP price index for Bitcoin. And they're not identical because they've got slightly different exchanges, but they're more or less the same, it's more or less zero. Um, and the blue line is the difference between the uh, coin gecko uh, VWAP price index for Bitcoin and the crypto compare one, which is the one I trust most. And you see that after the 20, 30th of January, 2018, the two diverged and it's the same for all of them. Um, if you lag it, then the divergence happens before. So obviously something went wrong. And I think they changed their timestamp because 24 seven trading, almost everything is standardized on 0000 UTC, but it's the one second after um, you know, it's, it's, it's that, for, that's the close price. Well, it's, uh, CoinGecko were doing an open price. So they were actually, um, I think something happened anyway. We did write to them. Um, we didn't get any, any response. Similarly for the Crix index as well, because the same thing, because the Crix uses CoinGecko data. So um, now you don't expect a zero line when you sit, look at the difference between two market indices when they're using completely different coins and and, and different types of cap weighting, but you do expect something smooth. And so be very careful when you're using that Crix data to, I, I, I would perhaps go for the CCI 30. I think that's by far the, the most um, reliable, if not the MVDA 25. Now it feeds into volatility. So I said, I was gonna talk about um, physical volatility. And this is the low volatility state. It's very difficult to get any sense out of a standard GARCH model. I'm not gonna go through what a GARCH model is, I'm sure you all know. Uh, and I'm sure you all know what an asymmetric, um, this is um, a GJR and the um, innovations are skew student T. So with your coefficients in each state, so this is one state one, turns out to be the low volatility state because the equivalent, you know, the unconditional volatility, the sort of long run volatility that you get is 49 or depends on the data you use. It could be 21, it could be 45, this is in percent, okay? That's as an annualized percent for the, um, for the volatility, but that's the low volatility state. Um, and uh, so when you look at the, um, at the leverage effect, um, that's what I've highlighted here in bold. You get very different results depending on the data that you use, um, sort of expected. Um, but if you don't put in this type of, um, to, to try and get robust results and um, you know, the model diagnostics to be, to be okay, Michael did spend a very, very long time and we ended up with, with a switching one because the, the um, rolling it for different data, there's actually no stability in parameters, but there is if you do it on a, on a Markov switching level. So here we see the typical negative leverage fit. What does this mean? It means that volatility increases more following a price fall than following a price rise of the same magnitude. And that's a very, everybody knows about that. This is very common in equities. So for example, um, uh, the uh, price of Ford, for example, of GM General Motors 
falls quite a lot and the debt to equity ratio goes up. Analysts start putting warnings out about this stock. Um, that's a sell signal and there, is fur there are further falls, et cetera, et cetera. This happens for individual stocks. It also happens for um, the whole S&P 500 index and any other stock index, this negative leverage effect. When a price goes up, it's good news and you don't get a, a high volatility. So for example, I was looking at the VIX at the moment, this wonderful linear trend in UX stock prices, um, which have completely diverged from stock markets all over the globe, despite the fact that the COVID pandemic is hitting the US perhaps worse than most countries. Um, uh, the VIX is 23%. <laughs> Hmm. And um, so, the, the, so volatility does not go up when there are price rises in equities, but it is the opposite type of leverage effect. But in a high volatility set state, you find you have um, a positive lever leverage effect. This is um, in the sort of bubble regime where a price rise leads to more volatility than a price fall of the same magnitude unless you're using the coin market cap data. Um, but for the others, you can see this reverse leverage effect that when, like now, we've got volatility is extremely high in Bitcoin, even though it's been relative, well, it's going up and down quite a lot, but um, uh, compare, it, it's, it's at a, in a high volatility regime at the moment. Um, and uh, the leverage effect, as I said, is positive further rises give rise to um, increases in the implied volatility index that I'm gonna be talking about in a minute. Okay, let's get on to price discovery. And for that, we need to look at the derivatives markets. Now, this is from Crypto Compare. Um, and uh, the work I'm gonna be talking about stopped here. Um, January, 2020 was when the data finished. So we were looking at, we didn't look at Binance because that's a tether exchange. Um, so we cut that out. Anyway, Binance at that point was not so important. We looked at Kuobi, um, we looked at uh, BitMEX, that used to be the most important one. Um, we looked at um, OKEX um, and CME, which is a very, very small portion still, um, the CME Bitcoin futures. They're just about to launch e Ether futures. They've got a few Bitcoin options as well, but they don't trade 24 seven. They trade a completely different way to the rest of the crypto market. So, um, but at least institutions are legally allowed to, um, to trade in them. So this BitMEX exchange um, on the right here is taken from my favorite um, place, Cointelegraph. Um, and um, this is just at the beginning of the year, BitMEX reports 100% of users are verified. The problem being that the CFTC went after BitMEX saying that US traders were using VPNs to trade on BitMEX and they're not allowed to because it's an unregulated exchange. And um, the flows onto exchanges are not recorded on the blockchain. They're completely anonymous, unless you use Tether or any other fiat. Um, if you put your euro or USD onto the BitMEX exchange, nobody knows. And there's, this is the Lightning Network, which is a second layer protocol on the Omni layer, is on the on the Bitcoin network. It's like the the Omni layer, but the Lightning Network is is another type of um, protocol that gets this clunky old blockchain that is built with bits of string and elastoplast. The Bitcoin blockchain was, 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 was just a sort of joke. It's nothing like, you know, Polkadot or Ether or all the, the sharding and, and, and parachains and the consensus algorithms that these chains are using. It's, it's really basic and it's still using proof of work. I mean, honestly, but there are these second layer protocols that allow you to open a channel, like you might have an account with a coffee shop. So you just, the only thing that's recorded on the blockchain is the opening and closing of the account. So nobody really knows what's happening. And this is the BitMEX Research Lightning Network. Again, just go to lightning.io and you can have a look at, at all the channels. And it, this used to be in London. And then in May um, last year, US banks were allowed to be custodians of Bitcoin and immediately the BitMEX Research Network located to, um, looks like New York here. So what is happening on BitMEX? So let's go and see. Um, this is just uh, the ordinary. Hello. Yeah. Quick. Am quick I half now? Just, just oh, a little bit. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you very much. 
Ah, uh, okay. I was going to look at the dodgy coin perpetual as well, just for to see what's happening to it, because as I said, uh, nothing much is happening. Okay, all right. Um, but I'm expecting dodgy coin to perhaps reach a dollar. In, oh, right. Okay. Now here we have a bit of maths. <laughs> Um, since it is a math seminar, um, allow me just to go through. It's a little bit of econometrics. Um, you all know about error correction models, I'm sure. Um, this is a vector error correction model in the usual form. So we've got the log price vector and we've got um, this disequilibrium term, this ZT. This is the co-integrating vector in a two-dimensional framework with spot and futures or something like that. It would probably be one minus one, you know, spot and futures being co-integrated and so forth. Um, and the delta, the signs on the delta make this into an error correction so that deviations from long run equi equilibrium revert. Um, this is an autoregressive framework. So you can invert that to a moving average framework for delta P and then you can integrate. And what you end up with is a model that has P zero. And then because assuming the, the beta um, are, um, are one minus one or um, similar to, to that, you will have all the rows of these more or less identical. And with an identical row, and this is a row vector, the cumulative shocks, the cumulative innovations from one to T, this is a row vector. So this is um, for each, it's the same term for each one of those prices. This is the common efficient price. And then we've got a moving average, average error term. Taking this row here, which is phi. Um, so there's the, the phi ET is the common efficient price. And this is the variance of it, where omega is the covariance matrix of the um, innovations there. Then we do a, a standard variance decomposition that gives us the information share. Most of you are very familiar with that. Uh, the problem with that is that M is a Kolesky matrix. The Kolesky decomposition isn't unique. And um, so we prefer the one that's based on the spectral decomposition. That's the Lean and Shrestha one. And we also look at different frequencies. We do this at the minute level day by day. So each of these models here is estimated on a day using minute level trade it, trading data. We look at different frequency, five minutes and so forth. Um, and then for each day, we compute the information share for all the markets. Which markets do we look at? Well, um, we look at these spot markets, Coinbase, Bitstamp, Bitfinex, Kraken, OK, Coin, all of, there's 10 different spot markets. There are standard futures, um, Huobi, o, um, OKEx, Bitmex, Deribit, Kraken. There are perpetuals, I wanna talk about those, so that's why I'm rushing because they're really interesting. They're products that are actually unique to crypto markets. And then we put all the main ones together. So let me just talk about the, the, the price leaders together. You can see that Huobi and OKEx were late starters. They didn't start until July, but they very quickly, oops, got market share. Um, and uh, uh, the BitMEX going down, um, CME has still got you know, 6% of the market share, but the contracts are really different. These are regulated markets, BATS more or less gone. This was the intercontinental exchange attempt to do some physical delivery. There was a lot of hype about it, but they've just been um, sold off to a, a third party. The CME are doing all right. They have margin requirements commensurate to the type of volatility you see in these products. And they're the, the standard sort of thing. So the contract size is either five or one Bitcoin and the margining and settlement is in US dollar. That's what we're used to. Okay, you've got your commodity and then you margin and settle in US dollar and the standard trading day of week eights. These unregulated futures like BitMEC, Derivits and so forth, um, different size contracts, but the size is in USD but the margining and settlement is in Bitcoin. They are inverse products. And these are just quarterly futures, but I said these perpetual futures. Margins, minimum margin requirements, you could have 100 times leverage. There are a lot of 100 times leverage people out there, but they do get burnt. Um, and the fees, I mean, this is for the maker, you get rebates. So that's why there's a lot of wash trading with makers setting up two accounts to earn the stable coin of the exchange. And the exchanges like it because it pushes them up in the rankings of the, I didn't show you the rankings on, on um, crypto compare, but they do rankings of exchanges, they do rankings of coins, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, moving on options and variant swaps. This is again, uh, Cointelegraph, just um, back in April, 2019, GSR launches, they call it a crypto hedging product, but of course, um, 
you don't get the same type of hedge from a variance swap because you've got the reverse leverage effect. Right now, a variance swap is not a hedge <laughs> because it's positively correlated. It's not, you don't get that, um, that diversification that we'd normally get. So um, Arben and I just very quickly replicated the VIX type formulae. This is um, from um, out of the money options. The Q are out of the money option prices for different strikes of a particular maturity. And you've got the usual um, geometric type replication for the, for the log contract payoff, which gives you um, a, a division by the square of the strike, which means the low strikes are the most important, the out of the money puts. Out of the money calls have much less influence on this. You do it for two different maturities and then you linear interpolate between the variances. Um, we do it in, um, because we're quoting it second by second, uh, well, 15 seconds now. So everything, and, and the, the, the maturity of the options, um, if I show you quickly on Deribit, what sort of, oh, okay, I haven't got time. I need to log in beforehand. But um, uh, you can have a look at the Deribit platform is actually operating a lot, lot more options than you get on S&P. They have day, one day, two day, weekly. Now they have three weekly. They have um, quarterly um, and go all the way out to several years. Okay, a couple of um, implied volatility indices as you um, will know that you know, you take a slice through at say 30 days, that gives you a smile surface and that implied vol index is one number that represents the entire surface. And it also corresponds to the fair value of a variant swap, i.e. swap that, that swaps realized volatility as um, computed by the sum of the squared log returns, albeit not a very good way to calculate realized volatility, but that, there you go, um, for a fixed swap rate. Um, so at least we have fair value swap rates. We calculated the term structure in the paper in, uh, we called it the VXBT. I use XBT and BTC equivalently because that's, we haven't really converged on XBT is the sort of standard exchange rate um, terminology beginning with X, but people are still using BTC. Um, looking at um, variance risk premium for $1 notional, um, it's big, you know, it goes up to 5,000 and down to 10,000. This is on 30 days, 60 days. Um, so it's the sort of very fast market that you might be looking at much shorter maturity swaps on. Um, here's a, 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 um, a graph that um, is from Crypto Compare showing how the Bitcoin volatility index going up to 100% there at a time when Bitcoin was going up to 20,000. Uh, people thought this was the bubble. Unfortunately, <laughs> I was wrong. It's gone, gone up even more. Um, so volatility rising at a time when it goes up. So um, this is um, the Bitcoin volatility index page. And let me just see what it is at the moment. Okay, so this, as I said, is being streamed every um, 15 minutes. At the moment, it's 132% um, compared to, um, uh, you know, it started off 90. Um, so um, if you want to look at more of the methodology, um, I did make a link to that because I mean, it's easy enough to just calculate that linear interpolation between two maturities of options, but that filtering out because of the strike range and um, and and uh, the lending in new options with very little volatility really took quite a long time. Okay, so now I want to move to the last part of the talk, um, and I see I have six minutes left. Hopefully, that's time enough, or maybe you, you can take a few more minutes, uh, Harold. Uh, but we'll eat okay. a little bit into the formal into the formal part. Of question, but I think it's interesting stuff. So uh, take eight minutes. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Because as I said, much more recent research. And the perpetuals are really, really interesting contract. Oh no, my internet connection is unstable. Did you see that? <laughs> I hope I don't go before I get to the interesting bit. <laughs> I, I've only seen the... Are you, are you still there? Can you hear I, me? Yeah, I can hear you, Carol. I can see the slide that says three dot hedging with perpetuals. Okay, good. I can't quite hear you, but hopefully you can hear me. Right. I can hear you clearly. Um, oh, good, good, good. Right. So um, the, what is this funding rate? Okay, so this is just a graph also taken from um, Great Southgate um, of the Bitcoin price until about last week. 
And these funding rates, which can be positive or negative, they seem to go up to about 40 bips, but generally speaking, they're about three, four bips. Um, and they can be negative. Sometimes they can go down to five bips and so forth. So what is this funding rate? And what's it got to do with the Bitcoin price? So this is the paper with um, Deng and John um, uh, uh, that we're working on right now. Uh, so these perpetual contracts have no expiry date, but they're, they're a bit like currency swaps with no exchange of notional. Um, so some people call them perpetual swaps, some people call them futures, perpetual futures. Um, and the way that the spot and the futures curve converge is via this funding rate mechanism. Um, and uh, a positive or negative rate means that there's a peer-to-peer -peer payment. Obviously, um, uh, this is done through the platform from long to the short side of the perpetual swap. Um, and a negative uh, funding rate means short to long. So it depends whether you're in contango or backwardation of the futures curve. For example, if you've got a funding rate of minus five basis points, that implies a payment of $50 on 100,000 notional from the short to the long. So um, this, this acts to, to decrease the contango or backwardation by um, making it um, less attractive to hold the, um, the futures over the funding rate timestamps. Um, most exchanges, Binance and BitMEX being the, 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 the most uh, heavily traded, they, um, they do the timestamp every eight hours. And it's by um, no coincidence that when you look at the average holding period, which you can derive looking at the open interest and the trading volume, um, it is around eight hours. Um, and the settlement in, in margining is also daily. So, you know, the hedging horizon is, is a very, very short, um, uh, or, or the trading horizon. I'm gonna be looking at the hedging problem with, with these guys, because they're ideal hedging instruments for miners. The, the, the correlation between the perpetuals and the, um, the, the, the spot is, is higher than it is um, than for the longer dated futures, of course because you know, quarterly futures would be higher up the curve. The problem is that um, there's ultra high leverage. You saw that um, this is from Deribit. Um, the, the minimum initial margin is 1% plus you know, a little bit times your position size, but forget about this bit. You, know, you could have up to 100% leverage almost, almost. And the maintenance margin is just 52 and a half basis points, even more, okay? Um, and the settlement takes place every day. The realized and unrealized session profits are always added in real time to the equity. Um, so um, the margin account gets increased or decreased in real time. And there will be a forced liquidation if the maintenance margin, if, if the account goes below the maintenance margin. So, I was talking to um, the, one of the main traders on XBTO today. He's actually an option trader, but he was talking about people trading on 100 times leverage or 50 times or 25 times and so forth. And very often the, um, the, um, the people trading on 100 times leverage are, are, are really caught short with liquidations. And I do definitely want to show you, you know, what's happening with those liquidations. Um, all right. so. Uh, the platform will automatically and incrementally liquidate the position to, to cover the margin call if, if it gets to that. So um, uh, Jun um, was um, looking at um, using the coin analyze data, which is, is really, really good. Historically, what sort of um, liquidations, forced liquidations were happening? And I mean, a lot of it was on BitMEX around the, what we call Black Thursday, the 12th of March. Um, but um, hang on, let me go back with this so I can get to coin analyze. Um, so um, the, the various perpetuals, what's this um, Binance? Binance perpetual, let's have a look at the Binance perpetual. That's the, probably the biggest one. So here you can see the open index. And if we look at 
liquidations, longs and shorts li liquidations, or um, so it's the liquidations of long positions, of short positions, and this is both of them. Um, so not so much at the moment, but if we look back um, over a longer period of time, you can see this is the daily value of long liquidations and the daily value of short liquidations um, going back to September. So you would see about 18 million of liquidations per day um, on the long side and about 20 million on the short side. And historically, um, uh, uh, we calculated the, um, uh, the probability of margin calls for different leverage positions uh, for different hedge horizons, one to 30 days. Um, this is pre preliminary. Um, I think what we really need, need to look at is, is much just focus on the um, shorter horizon, but try to get it up more to real time instead of monitoring um, at uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, but monitor it. Um, so there's, suppose the platform monitors the margin at some discrete intervals. It does it real time, but suppose it's a discrete inter interval. The hedger holds one Bitcoin at some time T and shorts theta units of the futures, the perpetual futures to hedge the volatility until some horizon T plus N delta T. So N is, is, is probably, you know, if this is 30 minutes, N would be 48 and, you know, you'd have 48, 30 minutes in a day, okay? Um, and then we've got the, 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 because of the inverse property, we can have a direct futures price, which would be in USD, but the inverse futures price is, you know, it's, it's all in Bitcoin. So um, we do our N period cumulative difference, okay? So this is the usual N period difference operator, which is on the spot, this is USD. And on the perpetuals, this is in BTC, and this is the other way around. It's the start minus end, because then a short inverse perpetual position will profit from a decrease in its USD value. That's why we have to do it this way. Um, and we multiply it by the price at the end of the period um, to convert it into USD. And so the realized PL at the end of the period, not counting what's happening in between with the margin calls, is um, this is your one unit of Bitcoin, and that's the price of Bitcoin, um, minus uh, your hedge position. So um, uh, this is the end period increment in Bitcoin, and this is the end period increment in US dollars. This is the standard problem, minimum variance hedge ratio. Um, suppose the hedger deposits little b Bitcoin into a margin account, so the leverage is B to the minus one. So if, if B is 1%, you've got a 100% leverage, okay? So B is your initial margin requirement. It must be say at least 1% on Deribit plus the buffer. And this is where the different traders have their own characteristics. Some are 25 leverage traders, some are 50 leverage traders. As I said, you know, depending on the, the, the outfit they're operating for. Um, so the cumulative unrealized gain or loss from time T to N delta T is you've got a position size theta and it's the N period difference. And if this is negative, there's a gain. And if it's positive, there's a loss. Don't worry too much about a gain. It's when the loss exceeds the buffer or the, the initial margin account. Um, and um, uh, it's a loss and if M is the maintenance margin, so you've got this constraint M, which is the difference between the initial deposit and the maintenance account. And once your loss exceeds M, there will be a forced liquidation. Um, and it's reasonable to suppose that M might be constant because if you get a lot of um, uh, gains um, in your um, market account, marked account during the day, um, there's a settlement at the end of the day and you can take those out and then start again. So we're gonna assume that this M is constant and so the hedger also wants to minimize the probability of a default event, which is the probability that the maximum of these, you know, the, the, the one period, the two period, the three period, up to the 48 period um, difference in price is greater than N. Um, and then if we introduce, yeah, have I gone over? Just interrupt briefly. Yeah, so we're running up to the 50 minute mark now. So okay. if you could 
uh, try to wrap because there's a bunch of questions and I'm sure you would like to address some of them. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So we convert it into the same sort of units, put in another factor default aversion, um, and then there is an analytic solution. Hey ho, it's not very, it doesn't look very nice, but there's an analytic solution. Because there's an analytic solution, we can do all sorts of sensitivity analysis and it behaves as we would expect it to behave, okay? So for example, the, the, the tail index, you see, it's the extreme value problem that you, we just, I just showed you here. This thing here is an extreme value problem. So we just fit a generalized extreme value distribution to those things, oops, going the wrong way, um, to get um, suitable parameters. Um, okay, well, look, um, on the correlations, they're high, they could be higher, certainly higher on S&P, but you know, it shows that one for one naive hedge is not gonna be optimal, even without the margin constraint, you would probably want to have di a, a different hedge ratio to one. Um, and you may be hedging any spot with any of the perpetuals, who knows, which is the best, depending on the spot you're trading. Um, so estimation of the tail parameters, differences, and we do extreme value. Um, it doesn't matter this tail parameter, the tail index for spot is more or less the same, but it's very different showing that you get quite different results for OKEX, Deribits and futures. And if you do it the wrong way around and you do the blue line, which is the direct one, you, you get quite a different result for that optimal hedging problem as well. Okay, so this just shows that it's effective. Um, the more um, uh, uh, default averse you are, the less you're gonna hedge and so, and so forth. So, so far we've got um, inverse contracts matters, Margin mechanisms are really important for optimal hedging in these products and different platforms to provide varying, he hedging, varying levels of hedging effectiveness. Um, and uh, anyway, so there we are. Um, let's go back to one of the exchanges. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank okay. you, Carol, for that whirlwind tour of this, uh, this <laughs> mysterious crypto world. Uh, we have some, a bunch of questions. And maybe, um, Augustino, I see you have a couple of questions in there. Perhaps you want to pick one to yeah, ask I'll, now. And then we I'll, I'll I will. Shall I stop sharing my screen? Uh, Shall I stop can, sharing? If you wish, but we may want to go back to slides, but sure. Yeah. So go ahead, okay. Augustino. Uh, so I, I think I will give a chance to others to ask because I will stay for the informal part so I can ask my questions later. Let's, okay. Let's, okay. Let's Great. Start. Uh, so I think the next question from Laura Leal, would you like to turn on your, your video and, um, and camera, sorry, your, your unmute yourself and I'm going to allow you to talk here. You should be able to ask your question if you'd like to, or I can ask it for you. Yeah, so can you make a parallel or a distinction between stable coins and the gold standard since they're pegged to the dollar? Could, could you say that again? A, a, a distinction between stable coins and? The gold standard. The gold standard. Since, they, since the coin is. Um, okay, so the gold standard um, was um, introduced obviously quite a long time ago, um, 1930s. Um, it was. Um, uh, um, the way that the, the, the gold standard was reset, I seem to remember, it, well, I wasn't alive then, but in the 1930s, I think there was the, the gold and silver acts and all US citizens had to relinquish all their gold at quite a low price. And then the, 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 the standard was set in, because gold was the unit of international trade. And it was a way that Roosevelt had of, I think, um, stabilizing um, in international trade. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the gold standard was supposed to be that the amount of gold in Fort Knox was equivalent to the amount of paper dollars that were printed. But unfortunately, was it Clinton, um, I think, uh, repealed that. And then of course, derivative markets came along and not only is the um, actual physical gold completely different to the amount of dollars that are printed, but um, the derivatives trading, of course, is, is completely um, decoupled from 
the underlying there. Um, now, the analogy with something like tether, um, I, don't, I don't really see the gold standard. I mean, yes, these stable coins are fairly stable. I mean, tether isn't completely stable. It, in the past, it has it's fluctuated down as far as 90 cents. And, and, and um, um, there have been some, some, some fairly strong decouplings. Um, and I'm only going to talk about Tether. I won't talk about any of the other coins. Um, but in the same way that the US dollar can now be printed, um, basically, you know, because the gold standard has been dropped, um, the US government can, can make as much dollar as they like. And they are. I mean, there's another. Is it seven billion that um, uh, the uh, the government have um, created in in M one M two or whatever in the money supply to deal with the COVID pandemic? Um, it's it's nothing like the um, twenty five billion of tether. I mean, it's a monster. It's like the T Rex of um, of currency markets. So I don't really see the analogy. I mean, so the the, the stable part of tether is that it's pegged to the dollar right yes yes supposed to be yeah and it's supposed to be pegged to the dollar because every unit of tether is supposed to have one dollar collateral somewhere in the bahamas <laughs> delta bank is supposed to be keeping this <laughs> are they is that checkable well, there's, there's a very big court case going on. It's been going on for about 18 months. So the New York State Attorney, um, uh, 850 million disappeared. And then they started um, reducing the capitalization. And then they got some un, unauthorized Delta Bank in the Bahamas because they, they keep sacking the auditors. It's a long story, but it's not really central to, to the talk, I think. Okay, how about let's uh, take one more, uh, one more question in the formal part, and then we'll move on to the informal part. Yeah. Uh, Yulia Malit Malitskaya, are you uh, able to ask your question on your own? Turn on your mic and yes, video. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, please. Hi. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> All right. So yes, it's Yulia Malitska. Um, good afternoon, Professor Alexander. Um, I had a few part, uh, few questions, So, but they're all interconnected. Yeah. So, they mostly relate to your first section. So on the paper on cryptocurrency data and analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think that starts on slide 15 in your presentation today. Yeah. And um, so from the paper, uh, it seems that market betas of Bitcoin differ uh, depending on the index selected. So my first question is, um, is this relationship dynamic time bearing? Okay, any market beta you can use a common filter or whatever you like. Um, most model parameters are not stable, okay? Whatever model you use, unless you use uh, stochastic local volatility with, um, um, with uh, time varying parameters, um, you're unlikely to be able to calibrate any model. All models are misspecified. So you, you calibrate your um, Heston model um, one day and the next day your parameters are going to change. Yes, I guess what I was more uh, interested also was like, did you try to separate the data into like um, the bull and bear markets and seeing how robust uh, the results would be according or like high volatility, low volatility states? No, no. Um, although with with Garch models, you know, if you are going to be looking at risk adjusted, you know, or risk metrics with, you know, sophisticated models, I mean, Garch models are used a bit too much in my view, they're used all over the place then I think you do need to have different states. With, but with a standard, uh, standard beta, um, you know, you know, maybe a market cap factor, small, medium, you know, small, minus, large, and there may be a few other factors, but the, all the factors that are driving um, crypto are completely different. They're things like stable coin supply, there's like funding rate, perpetual funding rates, miners activities. And these things are, are, are much more important for determining for an asset pricing model. So, um, you know, you wouldn't, a market beta is, uh, you know, relative to, to important factors. And we haven't even, know, we don't even know what the factors are now. Agree. Um, so let me just uh, com then combine question two and three. So question yep. two was, again, on the same chart. Um, 
whether with more recent now data from 2021, if um, the results have changed substantially or improved, for instance. And then I'm also interested within this context of what are your expectations on the potential quality of the announced S&P Dow Jones uh, cryptocurrency index to be launched in 2021? I didn't know that S&P Dow Jones are going to have a crypto index. Oh, that's jolly good. Thank you for telling me that. I'll go and have a look. Okay, great. So yes. I can't answer that question. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think that you have to be very careful about using the, the coin indices, okay, the, the VWAP indices, because they will give you quite different, and they're not traded prices. But if, you, if you're going to get prices, um, you may not, you know, if you want to do dodgy coin tether, then you'll have to go somewhere like OKEX. But if you want to do Bitcoin dollar or Ether Euro, go to Coinbase or Bitstamp. These are the two um, most, uh, um, if, look at, quite, at Crypto Compare um, and have a look at the exchange review. And that will tell you that they rank the exchanges and take the data from those exchanges. There's a very good place um, called um, Crypto Data Download, which will give you for free minute, hourly, and um, daily data on about 20 different exchanges. More than that, actually. It's probably about 30 different and exchanges in Russia, if that's where you trade. or um, And so make sure you get the data from the exchange you're actually planning to, to analyze. And um, the, the exchange arbitrage is more or less gone. It used to be a thing, a couple of... Um, a year or so ago, there were trading bots that had accounts on two different exchanges, and they could arbitrage between exchanges. But now the market's become efficient enough for the price to be very, very similar between those exchanges. But I would avoid using indices that are not traded. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Carol, for the uh, very interesting talk and discussions here. We're going to continue the discussions, but in an informal manner. So those uh, that would like to stick around and join the discussions to turn on your camera and unmute, just send me a message and I'll promote you to a panelist. Um, Augustino, is there anything that you would like to add before I end the recording for the, for the session? Um, I just, uh, just wanted to mention, uh, since we got some questions over the chat, that if you would like to watch uh, past videos or have information about uh, future talks, you're welcome to visit uh, the SIAM website. So I'm going to send the link right now so that everybody has it. Um, and you're, of course, welcome to do that. That's it. So looking forward. Okay, great. And a um, quick reminder as well that the next seminar will be March the 4th by uh, Marcel Newts. So I'm going to stop the recording now and then we can continue with our casual, casual chat. <laughs>